Charge is an intrinsic property of the electrons and protons that make up the world. Charge objects interact such that charges of opposite signs feel an attractive force between them, while charges of the same sign feel a repulsive force. The conservation of charge is absolute. There's no way to create or destroy a single charge, either positive or negative, but we could create or destroy pairs of charges with opposite signs so that the overall amount of charge is constant. For example, PET scanners in the hospital work because antimatter electrons, which are positively charged, collide with ordinary electrons, which are negatively charged, and completely destroy each other. We could write this as 1 plus minus 1 equals 0. The charge is balanced. Charge is also quantized. All the charges we see are an integer multiple of the charge on an, on an electron. It's not important in this class, but there are particles known as quarks that have charges that are integer multiples of one-third of the electron charge. This doesn't change anything for us because apparently the only way quarks exist is in triplets or in quark-antiquark -quark pairs, such that the total charge on any particle made up of quarks is still an integer multiple of the electron charge. The MKS unit of charge is the Coulomb, and the size of the charge in the electron in these units is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulombs. Basically, because Benjamin Franklin guessed wrong, we're left with the idea that the electron's charge is negative, so we say the charge on the electron, and really all electrons, is negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulombs. If we take a piece of amber and rub it with a cloth, we find that the cloth loses electrons to the amber, so the cloth becomes positively charged and the amber becomes negatively charged. We could do this with other things as well, using glass rods, animal fur, silk. In general, though, all macroscopic neutral objects are composed of equal numbers of positive and negative charges. We can use friction to separate these electro some electrons from their atoms, and that's what gives us a charge imbalance. We also need to discuss the idea of conductors and insulators. Conductors are substances, typically metals, that allow charges to move freely, which means they can carry a current. Insulators do not allow that. The explanation for this from the atomic theory is that in metals, each atom gives up one or more electrons to be a, to a part of the material as a whole. The electrons are still bound to the metal, but not to the particular atom that donated them. They can move freely throughout the entire metal. This makes them free charges. In an insulator, on the other hand, each atom holds on to its own electrons and they're not allowed to jump from atom to atom easily. If we try and divide all the materials in the universe into one of these two classes, it's a ridiculous approximation because if we look at the best insulators, they have resistivities about 10 to the 24th times as high as the best normal non-superconducting materials. So we're taking 24 orders of magnitude, a physical parameter that can range over that, and reducing it to binary. This is nuts, but it even gets worse because things that we think of as insulators, like plastic or rubber or glass, will also conduct in the right conditions. As crazy as this is, it's still useful to think of the idea of conductors and insulators in these broad terms right now. Once we have a charged object, through one of the methods discussed before, we can transfer that charge to another object. An obvious way is by contact, so we rub the charged body on an uncharged body. Another possibility, though, is induction. Let's say we bring a positively charged rod near a conductor like a metal sphere. Since the charges in the conductor are free to move, we see the negative charges move towards the rod and positive charges are left behind. We'll say positive charges move away from it even though really the positive charges are the nuclei and they're not allowed to move. The net effect is to polarize the sphere, meaning we now have a positive side and negative side even though the total charge on the sphere is still zero. Uh, in solids, we know that all charge motion is due to negatively charged electrons. It's still sometimes convenient for us to stick with this idea that positive charges are moving. So positive charge moving to the left is really the same as a negative charge moving to the right, except uh, if we are talking about something called the Hall effect, which we'll discuss later. Physicists tend to use this conventional current idea where we play like positive charges are moving, while engineers do the right thing and use negatively charged electrons as the, the actual current. 
if we charge things by induction, that's a way to do it without making physical contact and leave a permanent charge. So let's take our metal sphere from above and ground it, and that literally means connect it to the ground, because we can think of the Earth as being an infinitely large source or sink of electrons. So we can put as many electrons as we want into the Earth or draw as many as we want out. Now if you move near to this grounded sphere with a positively charged rod, we will attract electrons from all over the sphere, but we'll also drag up some from the Earth itself. Now if we move the rod, the electrons run back down the wire to the Earth, and the sphere goes back to normal. What if, though, we cut that wire before the electrons could run back down it? So we cut the wire and then move this charged rod away. Now the extra electrons can't escape, and they're stuck in the sphere, which is negatively charged without being touched. The particular form of the force between the charges, whether they're positive or negative, you know, whether they're opposite or, or similar, looks a lot like Newton's law of gravity from last semester. If we represent the charges as Q1 and Q2 and the distance between their centers as R, we can write F equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared. This is Coulomb's law, where K is the constant that's telling us about the strength of the force. In MKS units, K is 8.99 billion Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. Look how similar this is to Newton's law of gravity, which is F equals G M1 M2 over R squared. Now, gravity is always attractive, and we just had to remember that, but we can use the idea that a negative force is attractive and a positive force is repulsive, and then the signs of Q1 and Q2 will automatically take care of whether the force between two charges is attractive or repulsive. We can compare the relative strengths of gravity and this new electrostatic force by looking at the hydrogen atom, where we have a proton and an electron. They attract each other gravitationally, but they also attract each other electrostatically, and we can see which one is more significant. The distance between them in the ground state is about 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. We can look up the masses for the two particles. We can find the gravitational force between them, which is a problem we could have done last semester. And we get this ridiculously small 3.61 times 10 to the negative 47 newtons. If we look at the electrostatic force between them, though, we get negative 8.2, and again, this is attractive as well, we just left the negative out up here, negative 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. That still seems really small, but it's ridiculously large compared to the gravitational attraction. It's bigger by a factor of about 2 times 10 to the 39th. For comparison, if we look at the size of the universe compared to the size of a hydrogen atom, that's a factor of about 10 to the 37th. So this is 50 times larger than even that ridiculous ratio. Now, for so many purposes, gravity is insignificant. If you're looking at particle colliders like the Large Hadron Collider, they don't even have to consider gravity. Why is it so important to us that we start looking at it on day one of Physics 1? There's a couple of reasons. One is almost all matter is electrically neutral overall. So there's not a huge pull between you and your desk because you have an equal number of positive and negative charges, and your desk does too. The other idea is gravity is always attractive and never repulsive. So every single particle of the Earth is pulling on you with a component directed towards the Earth's center. The positive charges in your body are being attracted by the Earth's negative charges, but they're being repelled by the Earth's positive charges. Same is true for your negative charges. So if we have multiple charges present, we can find the force on any single charge by adding the individual char forces between charges. This is just vector addition like you've done since the beginning of Physics 1. Let's say we have a square with a charge at each of the four corners, and we want to find the net force on the charge at the lower left corner here, charge Q3. We're going to have to apply Coulomb's law to the three pairs of charges, 1 and 3, 2 and 3, 4 and 3. What we get from this, 1 and 3, we have our k, 25 nanocoulombs, negative 60 nanocoulombs, square of the distance, we get 0.0007979 newtons. This is along the line joining the charges, and it's attractive, so that makes it positive y-axis. Next, between 2 and 3, this will also be attractive. It'll be at a 45 degree angle 
above the x or to the right of the positive y and because this is also attractive and we put in the numbers 45 negative 60 notice the distance is square root of 2 longer this time so we got to include that we get 0 0.000718 newtons now to get the components we'll have to take that times cosine of 45 and sine of 45 so that means 0 0.000508 newtons to the right and the same size force up. The last two charges, 3 and 4 on the bottom, that gives us 0 0.0003191 or 92. This is repulsive, so this goes in the negative x direction. Our total force in the x is then... 0 0.000508 newtons minus 0 0.000319 newtons for a total of 0 0.000189 newtons and in the y direction 0 0.000798 plus 0 0.000508 and our total is 0 0.001306 newtons so we have our total fx our total fy we can use the Pythagorean theorem to combine them to get our net force of 0 0.00132 newtons. And the angle, we do the arc tangent and we get 81.8 degrees. In general, the force on some charge, capital Q, from any number n of other charges, little q i at distances, little r i from q would be this. Just k big Q times the sum of q i over r i squared in the direction between big Q and QI.